Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to have you with us here today. I'm joined by Shane Brearley, who I'll introduce shortly. Before we get stuck into talking to Shane about and living, uh, learning more about New Zealand living, I just wanted to go over some of the results from our recent construction survey, uh, supply chain survey, I should say, uh, results from November. So very, very recent information. Uh, we surveyed 219 product suppliers and manufacturers across all main product categories. A couple of good quotes um, just to set the scene. Uh, it's clear that builders and architects have taken on too much work. So from a supplier's point of view, there's more in the sector that's actually able to sustain. Second quote, there's an overwhelming volume of orders combined with reduced product of volume available. Because we are out of stock on so many lines, we really ship complete orders. So with that sort of sentiment, let's have a look at what we um, saw in the market. So again, the number of suppliers experiencing freight issues is still in the majority. So we've had an, a, a slight increase uh, in the last quarter. And when we think about what are the factors that are influencing um, those delays in, um, in supplying materials, very much still freight related. And you can see there a, uh, a small percentage increase, um, relatively actually quite large across a number of key factors. Now, I'll just remind you that these, uh, the full report will, is out tomorrow. Um, so we'll be emailing you a copy to download off the EBOS website. Uh, for the first time, we actually asked around uh, where products mainly coming from. And what we're seeing is a uh, increased reliance on Australian ports to actually get products into New Zealand, mainly due to the reduction in direct lines out of China and Europe to New Zealand. So we are dependent on the effectiveness of the Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney ports mainly. Um, we've got full breakdowns of those in the report, uh, but it's certainly something we want to monitor in, uh, in upcoming updates. Just wanna talk a little bit about price. So we can see here in our previous um, time period, we had 50% of suppliers had said prices had increased dramatically um, over the last six months, and they predicted prices to increase a further 27%. Well, when we then went back and asked them um, in October, what price increases have you seen over the last three months? 63% said that they've had dramatic increases and predicted another um, period of increases to occur between now and April. Uh, the rationale was not only um, obviously issues with freight, but also uh, an increase in the production costs of globally sourced materials. So when we looked across the board, just 22% of suppliers are able to pass on their cost increases quickly. Again, we, we talked about this delay um, with suppliers actually having to increase working capital um, to help facilitate a growing market. And a growing uneasiness of being able to pass on price increases in the future. Again, we've got more information on that in the report. So in a little bit more detail, we're looking at over the last three months, what is the cost that we've, uh, cost increases of buying the, uh, the products in and of selling. So let's look at structural um, products. So the last three months, we can see there's been, on average been a 21% in cost of the prices um, of components to come into New Zealand. And over that period of time, there has been a 11% increase in the sale price to the customers of those structural products. If we look ahead over the next uh, three or so months, we can see that there's a prediction of a further 13% increase um, in the cost of materials and an estimated 7% increase in the price um, that they will sell to their customers. We've got all that information across um, the main product categories. Um, and again, for you to digest in the report, but needless to say, we can still um, see price increases coming. Although in a lot of these categories, we can see that the, uh, the delta between the cost and prices seems to be getting tighter than um, what we had three months ago. Last slide here, uh, we actually asked about average leads times. 
So one of the considerations from the initial report uh, last quarter was around better communication and collaboration. And so what suppliers are telling us is that lead time for prices have increased. And we can see here, uh, again, I'm gonna pick on structure for no other reason than it's the top left. But you can see here the number of respondents and the level of stock that they have on hand. So we can see on average, there's a 10 week lead time for structural products into the New Zealand market. Now you can see that some suppliers actually need 24 weeks uh, lead time for ordering to delivery. So there's a, there's a wide range uh, here of lead times, but on average that's 10 weeks. And the sentiment from two thirds of suppliers said, look, we finding at the moment we've got very little impact, our ability to impact lead times. So they're trying to do as best they can, but often they're dealing with forces uh, far greater than they can influence. All right, that's our supply chain report. Again, um, you'll receive a, a copy um, or a link to the copy of that report uh, tomorrow. Uh, and it's got my uh, details in there. If you've got any questions or comments, please let me know. Um, now, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Shane Brearley from New Zealand Living to join us. Shane, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Shane, you're looking very, um, very relaxed there. Good Tuesday oh. afternoon. Yeah, no, just sitting in, uh, in a marina. Can't Excellent. Think of it Working from anywhere. Well, uh, great to have you with us today. And you know, the topic is very much around the uh, supply chain and of interest for us today, talking to our audience of suppliers, manufacturers and architects is how are developers coping with um, you know, the increased distractions and uh, issues around supply of materials and obviously a busy market. So, uh, firstly, let's learn a little bit more about uh, New Zealand living. And Shane, I'm just going to use your presentation here as uh, something for us to, uh, to guide our conversation. Uh, just remember, everyone, we've got the chat and Q&A line open. So if you've got any questions or comments, um, please send them through to Shane and I. So Shane, as a civil engineer, you've obviously had uh, a detailed uh, career in the construction industry. Um, through Australia, um, through to Multiplex, and then establishing New Zealand Strong uh, for a decade. Uh, Shane, you then went on to found New Zealand Living, and New Zealand Living is both a main contractor and a developer. Is that right? It is, and in many ways a subcontractor. So we do a lot of self-perform in certain trades. So trying to get as vertically integrated as we can. Right. A couple of sentences here. So to date, delivering 250 homes per annum with 10 FTEs. So averaging 25 homes per FTE. You've sold over 700 homes and you're doing that at effectively a discounted price to valuation, to standard construction costs and targeting that first home buyer in the property market. Quality homes, high performance and with a cost rate of uh, just under two and a half thousand a square metre. Yeah, that discount, uh, Matthew, was really just to, um, I guess, balance the equation uh, because of our lean approach and our low overheads and our uh, ability to control costs. It was sort of sharing a bit of the upside, uh, if you like, and um, it was uh, not that difficult to do because of our cost structure. Okay. And it's up to date, about 500 people get on the property ladder and another couple of hundred uh, soon to follow. All right, we're going to come back uh, to your approach shortly. I'm interested to get your view on the current market. And we're going to use this slide uh, as a quick reference. Really, I suppose, as, as a brief summary of uh, who's going well at the moment and what your view is as a, as a developer and contractor, who's winning? Well, the developers are probably the biggest winner. And although they might be getting a bit of a, um, a shock at the moment with construction prices and delays and consenting and so on, that is by far um, outweighed by the um, increase in sale prices in their stock. You know, when house prices have gone up by uh, 25, 30% across the Auckland region, at least that's a percentage on the top line rather than say, you know, an increase on the construction components, which is about half that value by quantum. 
So now the developers generally are a, a very happy little bunch. Yep. Um, and the you know the pressure is being felt by the builders and subcontractors. Um, the suppliers are able to pretty much pick and choose their their um, their clients, their price. They're probably reasonably happy, although under a lot of pressure to deliver. Um, the consultants actually, I was probably I was, I was tempted to put a smiley face on there um, for this reason. And that is that um, with the market, and this is something we'll probably touch on a little bit um, uh, further in, but I reckon it switched about three weeks ago and the light has gone out of, um, of sales, pre-sales. There has been a market change. And so the consultants might be smiling because a number of their projects where they have uh, PI risk for the performance of the outcome might never get built, mitigating their risk. Well, let's... let's- Come back to the um, to the market, um, and we'll just uh, I'll just keep things going. So here's a um, a completed recent completed project. We're we're in Auckland here. We're we're about Shane. This is an Only Hunger. That's three forty Only Hunger Mall. Yes. Yep. Red brick building uh, in the foreground. Down here. Great. Okay. We'll come back to that uh, shortly. But let's let's have a look at some of your insights into uh, costs at the moment. And I suppose looking carefully at your approach to the market, Shane, and, and what you're doing in the current market that's working. Yeah, so the biggest number you can see there, obviously, is construction. Unless you control uh, that line, it's really difficult to make any inroads to the cost of delivering built assets. Um, you know, you can overpay for land potentially, but generally that's because you're in a good location. Regulatory is uh, is what it is. Contingencies is um, uh, is a wise thing to have. Design generally costs what it you know it costs. Finance and legal. If you haven't got enough equity, that can cost more than it should um, to keep the banks under control. But the big number is construction. And unless you are on top of that component of your project, uh, any feasibility is going to struggle. Uh, you know, harder than it might otherwise need to be. Okay, so in terms of understanding uh, that breakdown, you know, it's fantastic to actually have some figures to be able to talk to. I just want to um, think about if, how we actually deal with that construction number and addressing that because that has the largest impact. And here, we're just, just interested in your comments around, again, your, your approach uh, to construction. So we call it um, on-site production, um, and we are constantly looking at how we can um, streamline our design, our consents, and through to our construction activities to try to get productivity on site um, up. And if we're, as an industry, constantly building prototypes, it's, it's impossible. And if you think of it like a sports team, if, if, a, if a coach of a sports team had to select a different player for each position each week, they're unlikely to be much of a winning team. But if you're able to build a team of constant players, improve on their skills, they all get to know each other's um, strengths and weaknesses. Um, and the communication is good. Their productivity will uh, and their winning record will improve. And unfortunately, our industry you know, is um, beset with predominantly tendering lowest price tender. Imagine if the All Blacks had to choose the lowest cost player for each position. So that's, that's the essence of it, is to um, get a team of people who care. They want to stay together for uh, a good period of time. And they you know, have pride in their work. They charge a fair price. They never have to compete on price. And we just get better and better each day. Shane, just reflecting on the last 12 and 18 months, you, we referenced a 2,400 square metre rate there. Has it changed at all? Um, over the time and if so can you tell us by how much yeah so our first project was uh, down in Otaha who called uh, Mason Square and we built that for 2750 that was our, our practice run we made a lot of mistakes in that uh, we had 50 apartments there were 21 different ranch lighter heights and widths which, out of 50 apartments we've now got six for the next 450 um, we went to stick build on the top floor. So predominantly our typology to get good density, good, um, you know, good solutions for the inner city isthmus uh, sites that we predominantly work on. 
um, the three-storey walk-ups. And we made the mistake of changing from a concrete structure to ground level, level one, on level two to going a timber frame solution. And we've got a time lapse coming up uh, shortly. And it was really, you know, if you build a floor in two weeks, take another two weeks, build another floor, take another two weeks and you're topped out. And uh, what was a trap, I guess, you know, the quantity surveyors will tell you, lighten your building up, um, use cheaper materials. But unfortunately, that often comes at a, a cost of program and complexity and extra labour. And you undo a lot of the, you know, good intent of what you were pursuing. Yes. Hey, why don't we uh, just jump to that? No, I'll, I'll come back to those slides. So again, let's, we, would, we saw the finished... Uh, image of 340 only hung them all. So this is your sort of build sequencing. So you just want to talk us through. So this is pretty much what we've done for the next 450. So that first project at 2,750 a square meter, and that's the, um, the, the, the total construction cost inside the GFA footprint, excluding GST, just to be clear. So then this project was our second one after that, and we built this for 2,100 a square metre. So we knocked 650 a square metre off. And the, the, the major changes are, you can see we've just gone another floor. We went again in um, 190 block work, and again with a, with a concrete um, 180 thick tray deck uh, roof slab on which we put uh, jockey trusses and form the um, colour steel roof. But what that enabled us to do is get watertight about three months faster than using a stick build top floor. That enabled two projects to be going on in tandem. One is the internal fit out could start so much earlier. And then secondly, you're building your, uh, your cladding, your, um, your envelope at the same time. And so instead of what would have been a 12 month program, we're building you know, those, that size project now in about nine months. And that's got a lot of PNG flow on costs but predominantly, it's in the trades. You know, our trades just went from twenty-seven fifty down to twenty-one fifty uh, from one project to the next, and we pretty well held that all the way through for the next three years. We're, we were at twenty-two hundred last year, and this year, because of material increases, we're at twenty-four. Okay, all right. So, in terms of that comparison to some of the studies you've done in the market, here we've got uh, your side by side. We've got the two models. So again, the numbers here look quite different and the cost implications obviously quite significant. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's about 50% different. Um, and, you know, this is a fully appliance, washing machine, dryers, drapes and everything all included in these, these prices. So it's fully tiled uh, bathrooms, constituted stone, uh, kitchen benches and the, the real key, you know, and, and we've enhanced our product as our pricing, as our costs have come down. So we've been able to embellish the product. Um, we used to just take um, the marble tiling, uh, sorry, the ceramic tiles in the bathroom just uh, to 1,200 high. We now go to the ceilings. So we're trying to put some value back in, into the product. But you, you imagine from a, from a developer's perspective, putting in $45 million for the cost of the homes versus 65. You know, that's the difference, but it's, you know, it's even a quarter of that is the difference between a project being viable and not. Yes. So really, you know, even in these inflationary times, we've still got plenty of freeboard to be able to just carry on doing what we do. For the architects uh, in the design costs, you know, the architects and engineers, I can assure you that our consultants are making more money than they were on other bespoke clients' jobs, charging three times as much. Well, let's, they are, um, they're so much more efficient. Than that. Yes. Well, let's have, have a look at that. So, in terms of the improvements that you've um, that you've seen, and talking about those design costs, again, yeah. fantastic for you to be able to share some real data around um, what you've been able to achieve. Do you want to just talk through the difference here and what the end result is for um, NZ Living? Yep. So if, we, if I look down that list, um, you can see there's been quite a quantum leap in uh, efficiencies through, um, through all of those categories. Um, our, our, our time to start being just eight months. I know Kainga or about two and a half years for the same type of development. Uh, so we'll be fully consented, building consent, resource consent, working drawings within eight months of having first walked on a site and considered a master plan. So it's super fast to get going. The drawings, if you look at uh, where we were 
uh, at about five drawings per apartment. It's now two and a half, but the, the other underlying factor in this is a third of those only are bespoke. That's the architectural finish and the way we assemble the various standard um, componentry. So a third are GAs and the other third are standard proven um, details that our, our construction workforce all know and understand and get right 100% of the time. So there's still enough room in there to put the flair into the architectural design and everything, but the basic componentry is rock solid and locked away. You've got confidence. Well, you've got confidence the supply chain that they know what's coming. Uh, should be very similar to what they've seen before. That's right. Once you get the ground floor slab down, you're away. But um, you know, the other interesting thing is the suppliers are all talking to each other. We don't have to be the um, the sheepdog or the or the policeman um, on you know in in the mix. The guys all work shoulder to shoulder and have done for the last 500 apartments. So they coordinate each other. They let each other know when another floor will be available for the next trade. Yes. Well, uh, let's continue on. I want to come back, Shane, to your, your view around how you approach the building site. We look at that and we can, we can see a lot of, uh, lot of activity going on. When you look at this, what, what do you see? Well, it's a production line. So it's not, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's more like car manufacturing. So our first project, uh, just going back to that one in Otahu, we had a carpentry and concrete labor force of about 145 people. This site is bigger than that. And we had about 45. This, we've, we've got two projects underway at the moment, uh, 129 homes and 132 in Greenslade Crescent in Northcote and over in Kupanga, Pilkington Road, Point England. And they've each got around 32. So 32 versus wow. what was 145. 45. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's all about um, keeping a cool head and working methodically in a very predictable pattern. So the taller building in the background of this shot is building A. We follow the alphabet, A, B, C going anti-clockwise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whereas... Most construction people will look at that and say, wow, I've got five work bases that I can attack all at the same time. Let's get five blockies, five brickies, five painters, five window suppliers, and let's hit it all at once. And that's where your costs will go through the roof. So, yeah, it's a very calm, very, um, very peaceful kind of site to work on. There's nobody running around or crawling on top of each other. So let me get this right. Um, you've brought down your construction time. We had 12 months to nine months um, with a, uh, a quarter to a third of the staff. That's right. So this project is 102 homes we built in 13 and a half months, including a little bit of early COVID, April of last year. So we, are, we built one new home every 2.6 working days completed on average at $2,150 a square meter. Fantastic. Well, with that in mind, can we just come back to the cost of building and particularly um, prices? So as a developer and as a contractor, what, what are you seeing and how are you adjusting to the, uh, the impact of, price, of product availability and cost? The biggest impact is not materials, not freight, but uh, labor in our experience. So, uh, you know, and that's, that's not a bad thing. If you've got somebody who's expert at bricklaying who was on $27 an hour, now he's getting paid 34, then good luck to him. You know, that's, that's great. Um, but I, I did an exercise on a typical 100 apartment um, project, like the photo we had up previously, and the num the amount of overseas imported materials that we need to build 100 homes was around 32 40 foot equivalent containers, and they've gone up in price by about double. You know, it's not much short of um, not much short of 20,000. Dollars per container these days by the time you get all your duties and your clearances and get it off the wharf. And we bring a lot of stuff in from uh, mostly China, a little bit of Europe. Uh, bricks come from Spain, um, yep. those kind of things, steel and so on. Um, so, you know, if, if, if that's doubled in price, that's the equivalent of 
$320,000, which is about 1.3% of the total cost of building 100 apartments, which is around about 24 million. And then we looked at the cost of material increases, which we all know have gone through the roof. And the biggest mover is probably steel mesh going up around 50%. Um, but if you look at the you know, various parts of a building project like ours, the site works haven't really moved much, um, you know, because it's all locally sourced, bit of fuel cost increase. Um, the structure, again, concrete, we used to pay um, 220 a cubic metre for 30 MPA. That's now about 228, so it's very little movement. The big movers are in um, in structural steel, timber up 20%, jib board up about 20, 25%, and services with overseas imported wiring and that kind of thing. But when you analyze it all down, as you can see there, we've got around about $850,000 in total um, cost increases. And we've got some really good data on this because um, you know, we've just finished uh, 102 homes, we're building 129, we've just, we've just started 132, so they're all sort of similar in size, and the total material cost <laughs> increase that have gone rampant equate to about a 3.5% increase. So add that to the freight, 1.5%, you've got 5%, which isn't too far off a CPI. Yep. So, you know, these kind of cost increases pale into insignificance when you look at what your productivity gain opportunities are, you know, if you're building at 3,400 versus 2,400, um, you wouldn't want these on top of 3,400, whereas we've got a lot of free board. Yes. So with, with that in mind, Shane, we've got quite a few suppliers um, with us today. What's your advice to them in terms of what they should be focusing on or need to ensure they have in terms of their service offering to be working closely and you're partnering with New Zealand Living? Yeah, so probably the key, you know, we, we found really good success with owner operator companies, those mid, mid sized companies where, you know, the people in, involved in them care and they're looking for long term relationships. They're not looking for a quick buck or, you know, in and out or variation claims uh, conscious. You know, they, they'd rather put the energy into working collaboratively, working on each other's efficiency and, um, you know, helping each other out so that it all works efficiently for both parties. You know, we've got a lot of simple things that, you know, we, we've shown good faith. Um, there are no retentions. There are no bonds. Why would you do business with somebody that you didn't trust and you felt you had to have a bond or a retention on? And it's complicated to manage, so get rid of it. Um, and we pay the day of invoice if, you know, if it's late in the day, we have to wait until the next morning. So we just, you know, get the money flowing. It's a reciprocal caring arrangement. There's more than enough money for everybody to make a fair buck. And then you're looking at the five and 10 year and 15 year horizon. Why would you want to go back into the jungle, tendering for work, trying to, trying to guess which projects are going to be better run than others, rather than have a trusted, proven, safe collaborative arrangement where you are making a fair profit yes so it sort of all makes sense you know take the friction out of it there's so much loss and friction and then you also can't think um, because you're defending your position on your tender price or whatever yes. and it takes you know you're too scared to suggest an improvement because who's going to get the benefit of that I'll just give you one quick example. Our electrician was um, charging us around about $12,000 per apartment. And I joked with him one day. I said, um, you know, we're, we're going to try not to pay you more than $12,000 an apartment for the next 10 years. And he said, well, wow, hang on. How does that work? I've got increased material costs, increased labor costs. And I said, well, so you're telling me you're not going to innovate and get more productive by at least the rate of inflation each year. We're an intelligent being. Um, two projects after that first one, he was delivering them for $10,500 per apartment because of the smart ideas we'd all come up with. Yep. Packing your strapping and lining off the wall so you can automatically feed your, um, your cabling, your pre-wire through. And, and we honoured our word, we left it at 12000 and he was making double the profit. So across 100 apartments, there's, uh, there's over 100K there. Yep. yep. 
and that was to his benefit. But he's got to try to play the ten year game and keep thinking. And so, keep with that in mind, um, innovation uh, again, thinking about our audience, if they've got innovative products that they think would be a benefit to the type of projects you're doing here, Shane, what what advice do you give them in terms of how they can present that um, or educate your team on what they're doing? Yeah, well, our um, consultant base is there to sort of assess um, innovative things. But as long as they're not, um, you know, they've got to be robust. They, you know, there, there's some wonderful shiny things that come through and you yes. get tempted by the technology. But we're building a robust um, home that is going to last for, for decades. And, we're, you know, we're looking at designing these for a 100-year design life. We've had electric blinds and all sorts of gizmos and stuff, and they all break down and we put in standard standard lines, you know, that kind of thing. So you can get a little bit too clever. We're building robust, durable, long-lasting homes. And so all the fancy stuff is, it's probably more the work, the way of working, the, the philosophy of protecting everybody's interests and making it an enjoyable, um, successful outcome for everybody. So it's yes. a philosophy, I think, more so than a, than a gizmo. So with that in mind and your reference to the production site being that of, uh, oh, sorry, of the construction site being a production process, is there any theory or any advice for suppliers thinking about how they can get a deeper understanding of that approach? Got any books or tips you can give people in terms of doing a bit of homework? Oh, it's the Toyota way. I and mean, that's, I was very lucky. I worked for Lend Lease about three or four years out of university and I got to study lean uh, production systems. And that stuck with me uh, my whole life. But, you know, you, you can't do it in isolation. You can't be one part of the overall machine um, working lean. The whole, the whole supply chain needs to. So, you know, my first suggestion is try to find a, a team that you can stay with and all, you know, so try to try to create a vertically integrated team where the architect, the engineers, the constructor, the developer, I, I think that's the future because the market, in my view, has, um, has hit a bit of a wall in the last two or three weeks, and it's going to get really tough. Uh, and a lot of the projects that are being proposed at the moment, I, I don't think um, they will all happen. There'll be a good number fall over. So that will lead to a bit of a downturn in the amount of new uh, work coming through the pipeline, just the unaffordability uh, equation. And so people will have to start thinking about, well, how are we going to get out of this, um, these, these shackles that we're currently in? And to me, the solution is forming a consortia of vertically integrated people that all get on, all think, all work together and create a wonderful little team. Yes, well, just thinking about the future, can we quickly just, um, we're running out of time, but talk about Simplicity Living. Obviously, that was announced last, uh, last month that you've teamed up with the Simplicity Kiwi Saver and Investment Fund to develop projects that they will, um, they will obviously own and rent. Yeah, yeah. So we've got, um, you know, this huge source of capital coming through. And my wife, Anna, and I have... Um, gifted uh, NZ Living to Simplicity, all the IP, the company, um, and we're going to commit the next five to 10 years of our life um, working pro bono to help deliver this, um, this big pipeline of build to rent housing. And it came about because the people we were selling our uh, Kiwi build type houses to would invariably on sell, you know, within a few years at full market. So any benefit to that to a more affordable housing solution uh, in New Zealand would be lost. Would lost. So with this simplicity, you've got a long term view, um, and uh, you know the the intention is to put uh, ten thousand new homes across uh, across the country, predominantly Auckland, then Tauranga, then Wellington, and you know using our machine to be able and our IP and our team. Um, it's going to be a powerful little combination delivering more affordable rentals because we've got a lower cost of construction. There are no margins on margins being, being taken out and, you know, good investment return for our KiwiSaver members. So Shane, you, you're actually gifting the construction development company into Simplicity Living, which will effectively be the client and operator of these buildings? Yeah, which is really a re a, 
a rebranding of us. So all of our subcontractors, all of our consultants will all transfer into this. Um, you know, we're, we're delivering 270 next year homes and they'll, they'll, that will include the last couple of projects for NZ Living. But then we're looking to ramp that up to 300, 400, 500. And then within three to four years, we'd like to be doing 1,000. We've currently got sites for about 1,500 homes. And if the market has turned, our timing couldn't be better. You know, hopefully it is going to come off this crazy peak we've been on. Yep. And now we're just going, you know, we've got a 10-year pipeline, 10,000 homes, got a big job ahead of us. Wow. Uh, just a comment from Tony. Um, the, you know, this um, downturn that you've seen over the last few weeks, uh, he's asking, is that due to the interest rate movement or, you know, something in particular? There are three three parts to it. One is interest rate. Two is the case in Remuera uh, last week. I don't know if you saw it in the in the media. No. Where a, no. Where a development was stopped at three quarters complete. And any bank looking to fund a project with that kind of risk. So if you if you search that um, that legal case, this is a fully consented project, resource consent, building consent approved. And this project was stopped. So that's going to send a bit of a, a bit of a wake up call, well, a bit of a shot over the bow for people who, you know, who are looking for funding and how, how the bank's going to get absolute certainty that there isn't going to be a similar event happen. And thirdly, just the unaffordability. So I think the market sales um, are likely to, you know, they hit a ceiling. And so now the pre sales, if they're not going to come through in the same volume, then the bank funding isn't going to follow and the project is going to be slower to get off the ground or not at all. Yep. Shane, we've, we've covered a huge amount of ground. Thank you for that wonderful summary uh, and overview. Look forward to learning and seeing more with Simplicity Living um, over the upcoming months.